Good evening, everybody. And please take a seat. It gives me really special pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's special lecture. It's not only our usual Friday night lecture, but I know it's also the start of holiday weekend for two major faiths. So I'm deeply grateful for all of you to be here tonight. The good news is that we're in for a real treat with tonight's speaker. Professor Montas has an inspiring personal story about which I'm sure you'll hear a lot more tonight. But the more important part for all of us is that his incredible personal story is closely tied to his encounter with the great box, with the liberal education we all cherish so much. His recent Princeton University book, Rescuing Socrates, colon, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter to a New Generation, is a passionate declaration of love for the liberal education. It is a reminder of its ongoing importance and a call for its great, or I may say even greater today than ever, relevance. The book has been widely praised, including by our own Sina Hitz. Professor Montas tells a story of personal change, of personal growth, facilitated and perhaps turbocharged by Columbia's Great Books curriculum. And he makes a powerful argument for expanding access to this curriculum to those who have traditionally been underrepresented in institutions of liberal learning, such as Columbia and St. John's. The Great Books curriculum has a unique power. You all know this. It provides access to self-knowledge and introspection but it also facilitates social mobility and provides the soil for democracy to flourish. I would argue that the future of democracy, including our own, might well depend on that access to all of liberal education today. Now, you are all the living testimony to this type of education, how it provides you with the foundations and the insights into the foundations of our political, economic, and social systems, and how our own seminar-style education has taught you to listen carefully and to respond thoughtfully to others, however difficult you may find their opinion to hear. Those are also the crucial elements of flourishing democracies. Professor Roosevelt Montas not only underwent a personal transformation due to his encounter with the great books, but he has spent his career engaging with liberal education, and especially with a core curriculum offered at Columbia University, a curriculum in which we might see our own reflected, though absolutely not merit. Professor Montas received his undergraduate master's and PhD in English and comparative literature from Columbia University, where he focused on antebellum American literature and culture with a particular interest in American citizenship. After he was granted both a prize for his PhD and a presidential teaching award as a graduate student, Columbia quickly appointed him as a faculty member. For a decade, he served as the director of the Center for the Core Curriculum, in which he continues to teach. Today, he also directs the Freedom and Citizenship Program at the Center for American Studies, where he focuses very much on bringing the liberal education to K through 12 education. But whatever Professor Montes' title, what I have learned today is that he is an educator, a liberal educator, always first. Now let me just remind you that Professor Montes will deliver his lecture and after that, we will take a break for coffee and tea next door. And after about 15 minutes, we will come back here for questions and answers with our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I absolutely cannot overstate what an honor it is for me to be here. And the ways in which this institution is a spiritual home for me. Um, thank you all for being here. 
Thank you, Nora, for that really gracious and generous introduction. Um, thank you all for your attention. Today is a, it's a, it's a big day. It's Good Friday. It's the first day of Passover. It's in the, in the, in the holy month of Ra Ramadan. Um, I haven't had this much competition for people's attention. <laughs> probably since the night that Joe Biden was given his State of the Union address and I was speaking somewhere else too. <laughs> this is bigger. Uh, just, just about two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, in fact, on, on April 1st, on April Fool's Day, I was at Santa Fe, St. John Santa Fe, and gave there a talk that is substantially uh, similar to the one I'm giving today here, and I want to apologize to you for that and um, for the fact that I will read this text. I, by and by, I will develop the skills and the courage to extemporize and not bend to this ridiculous academic convention of standing in front of an audience and reading a text. Uh, but I ask for your indulgence as I do that. Again, I am, I'm working on it, and I'll get better at that. Um, when I was preparing to, to talk in Santa Fe, I began to grapple with the obvious problem that this, that this talk presents for me, which is what to say about liberal education and great books at St. John's College. For years, I have traveled the country talking about the nature of liberal education, about the imperative at a time like this, for colleges to take seriously their mission of educating their students liberally. Drawing on my own experience, I have emphasized the urgency of making liberal education accessible to people who come from what we call marginalized communities, people who have not had access to the resources, opportunities, and privileges that most people who attend college have had access to. And throughout, again, drawing on my own experience, I have emphasized the model of liberal education based on the reading and discussion in small instructor-led seminars of great books. That's the fight I have been fighting, the fight that I'm used to fighting. But here I am now at St. John's College, the mecca of great books education. Someone correctly told me that coming to St. John's to talk about the importance of great books is almost like a joke. So my way out of this difficulty has been to put out of my mind the tutors, the staff, and the alumni and others who would be here tonight and to think only about the students. So with the indulgence of those distinguished and revered persons, I want to address myself primarily to students tonight. You all chose to come to St. John's College and you did so because St. John's is different than other colleges. You came here to find something that you knew you would probably not find anywhere else. I can't help but admire that choice. When I applied to college, I knew very little about the landscape of higher education. Though I ended up there, I didn't know what the Ivy League was, nor what a research university was. I didn't know what liberal education was. I can't help but wonder what I would have made of St. John's if I had come across it as a high school student, and what it would have taken to get me to grasp the meaning of a liberal education based on the study of great books. As it happens, I ended up at the only Ivy League school with the required great books curriculum. It takes up most of the first two years of study for every student at Columbia College. The way in which that intellectual experience expanded and transformed me suggests to me that I would have blossomed here at St. John's College. So the question returns, what would it have taken to communicate to me what a St. John's College education means, that is, what a liberal education based on the study of great books means? As I pose that question, I realized that much of the work I have done promoting liberal education, including the book, the book I wrote recently, is an effort to create the conditions in which someone like I was in high school could have access to the kind of education that I, almost by accident, and that you, probably by intention, are having. 
it strikes me as a task of the greatest importance today to expand the reach of this approach to education to people who have traditionally been excluded from it. In my experience, when people are given a taste of what liberal ed education does, they want it for themselves and for their children. People have an impulse towards freedom and self-determination, a hunger for truth and self-transcendence that makes liberal education immediately compelling. Don't let anyone tell you that all that low-income and first-generation college aspirants want from college is a job. It's not true. Like everyone else, they have needs and aspirations that can only be satisfied by non-economic goods. Like everyone else, we want and long for an education that addresses our entire humanity, not just our stomachs and our pockets. An education that not only teaches us, teaches us things, but that transforms us. Let me pause on that claim that education, and liberal education in particular, has the power and the tendency to transform people's lives. It's a claim that liberal education shares with self-help, with religion, and with many forms of quackery. It's a big claim to make. But the kind of transformation that liberal education holds out is distinctive and fundamentally different from the possibilities for self-transformation that are offered by self-help, religion, and quackery. Quackery, of course, only offers, but doesn't deliver self-transformation. For one thing, the transformative power of education unfolds in as many varieties and configurations as there are individuals in the world. Like self-reflection, on which it depends, liberal education cannot have a predetermined outcome. Another way in which the kind of transformation that liberal education promotes is distinctive is that it is thoroughgoing. Like walking through a thick, a thick fog, it soaks you through and through and everywhere at once. Liberal education doesn't just add knowledge on top of your previous stock. Liberal education rearranges everything else that you know. You don't just end up with more knowledge you end up with a different configuration of knowledge. Liberal education, in other words, alters the internal proportions of your soul. So this book I wrote is called Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation. You can hear the claim I am discussing embedded in that title. And you can also hear how it sounds a little bit like a self-help book. I wrote the book, but when it came to giving it the title, I left it up to the people who make a living from selling books and only expressed my hope that the words liberal education would appear in the title. My hope was not fulfilled. <laughs> you can think of the book as being braided out of three strands. The first strand is autobiographical, and that part of the book reads like a memoir where I reflect on how my life has unfolded and the role that a liberal education has played in it. That is, how liberal education has altered and shaped this particular life. The second strand of the book consists of a discussion of four authors that have had a big impact on me and why their ideas and texts continue to, ma to matter. The authors are St. Augustine, Plato, Freud, and Gandhi. Then the third strand of the book is a polemical strand. It's a look at the shape and character of American higher education and the place of liberal education in it. I make the basic argument that contemporary American higher education is essentially a hostile environment to the practice of liberal education. And I can elaborate that very quickly to say that this hostile environment has a lot of aspects to it, and let me highlight three. One is kind of a social cultural aspects. We live in a society and an American culture with a strong focus on practicality, on pragmatism, on the usefulness of things, on a practical education. The whole uh, capitalist, consumer, free market culture encourages practicality and usefulness and has a hard time even grasping the idea of something that doesn't have a, a utilitarian value. So there is a, a cultural climate that is hostile to the practice of liberal education. There are also institutional forces 
that make the university hostile to liberal education. You can, you can describe it in many ways, but one broad way of describing it is that the university is organized around disciplinary boundaries. Of course, this is like much else I'm going to I say about higher education does not apply here at St. John's. But the university in general is organized around disciplinary pigeonholes along which flow budgetary and faculty lines and other, uh, other arrangements. And there is no space, no curricular space or institutional space for true liberal education. Liberal education has been almost entirely subsumed inside disciplinary specialization so that in many schools, the liberal education requirement, sometimes called the general education requirement, simply consists of taking introductory courses in a, in a, in a, in a number of disciplines. Um, then there is a, another kind of source of hostility for the practice of liberal education and its epistemological developments uh, within the academy um, have brought into question some of the very fundamental notions that a liberal education depends on, uh, notions like truth and virtue and excellence are all uh, suspect. And in my view, you cannot practice liberal education absent the possibility of rational inquiry and rational attainment of some of these, um, of these concepts. Now, my choice to write about my own life reflects my discovery that I cannot make a full-throated case for liberal education without also reflecting on the relationship, my personal relationship to it, how I have um, enacted and how my life has been, my particular life in its specificity, has been influenced by that education. Now, I am, of course, not unique in experiencing education that way. I would bet that many of you listening to me have had a similar experience. And let me invoke this experience as it began for one of my intellectual and political heroes. Frederick Douglass. This is a passage that I'm sure many, perhaps all of you are familiar with from his 1845 autobiography narrative of the life of an American slave. Um, this passage comes early in the narrative. Douglass was born uh, and raised here in Maryland. He was born in Talbot County. Is that anywhere nearby Talbot County? No. Um, when he is around eight years old, his um, legal enslaver sends him to live in Baltimore in the city. And when Douglas gets there, there's a little boy in the household that he, he was sent to be a companion to. And um, it's a huge revelation for him. This incident that I'm about to read happens early in, after his arrival. Let me say a word about this quote I'm going to read. It has the N-word in it, uh, spoken by his enslaver. Um, that word, as you well know, has assumed a voltage in our, in our culture that has made it um, virtually banned in public spaces. And um, in deference to how some people, including some people I know well, find this word so dehumanizing and offensive, I'm not going to say that word. I think if we were in an intimate context where you knew me and I knew you, I might just read what Douglas wrote. Uh, but in this case, I'm gonna replace that word with the word slave. Um, but let me say that that word was a slur was offensive, was, had very much the same implications and connotations that it has today back in the 19th century. So here's Douglas. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Ald, she kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point in my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his own words further, he said, if you give a slave an inch, he will take an L. We have a version of that saying today, if you give someone an inch, they'll take a mile, right? If you give a slave an inch, he'll take an L. A slave should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best slave in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that slave, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, 
it could do him no good, a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering, and called into existence a new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation, explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. This is fascinating. So Douglas is a, is a boy. He's a black person. He hangs out with black, black people. He knows that they're not dumber, that they're not weaker, that they're not in any way less than the white people, and who he knows very well, too, because he's a household slave. He knows that the white people are not better, smarter, stronger than the black people, yet it's the white people who enslave the white people. Why? How is this? He can't figure it out, and here he discovers it, like a revelation. It has to do with access to literacy and controlling knowledge. He says, from that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted, and I got it at a time when I least expected it. Whilst I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my kind mistress, I was gladdened by the invaluable instruction which by the merest accident I had gained from my master. Though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with high hope and a fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn to read. And boy, did he learn to read and write. Today, you might say, though, there is no more slavery. Slavery is a thing of the past, outlawed by the 13th Amendment. It's true that there is no longer in the U.S. chattel slavery, where you and your children are literally owned by someone else 24-7 and forever. But there are other forms of subjugation, coercion, and domination that pervade modern life and which have much to do and, and a lot of similarity with slavery. Liberal education, the kind of education into which Douglas saw a window in the acquisition of literacy today is also aimed at charting a path from slavery to freedom, at somehow transforming you in such a way that you are forever unfit to be a slave. Let me point to two broad domains in which forms of enslavement persist in contemporary society, one public and one private. One pervasive form of subjugation that exists around us is that what some people have called wage slavery. That's when you sell your labor for a period of time and are, during that time, effectively subject to a master. This form of slavery was recognized even in antiquity when there still existed chattel slavery. I'm not going to get very much into this, but let me say that it's almost taken for, taken for granted today that this is okay, that it's some kind of life to sell yourself to servitude and dehumanization from Monday to Friday in order to buy the privilege of living on the weekends. But that's not so. This is not the worthiest life for a human being. There is no virtue in that, no expression of human excellence, no recognition of human dignity. On the contrary, a degrading brutalization of human nature. So it's not education to prepare you and convince you to sell some portion of your humanity for wages. Yes, of course, education should give you skills and competencies that have value in the marketplace and enable you to make a better living than you would without an education. But there is also a higher and more fundamental task for education. And in our colleges and universities, the liberal arts are the curricular expression of that more fundamental calling of higher education. Education should also be about how to be free, about how to live the life of a free individual, not just about how to sell your labor. But that's one form of subjugation that exists today. There is another, even more pervasive kind of subjugation and slavery, and that is when one aspect of ourselves exerts tyrannical control over another. Here, let me quote Jean-Jacques Rousseau from The Social Contract, where he says as a kind of throwaway line, for to be driven by appetite alone is slavery, and obedience to the law one has prescribed for oneself is freedom. So this even more pervasive aspect of servitude has to do with the contradictorily layered nature of our psyche. 
Freedom, you know, is great, but it brings its own problems. Until recently, many of you lived at home under the governance of your parents. As you know that, remember, one of the shocks of college life is the challenge of self-governance. Most people who fail at college fail not for intellectual reasons, that the material they are asked to learn is just beyond their grasp, but because of failures of self-governance. How do we organize the tangle of psychic forces, conflicting desires and contradictory impulses that coexist in our mortal frame? You know, you wanna be fit, but you don't wanna work out. You wanna be on time, but you don't wanna get up. You wanna get high grades, but you don't wanna do the homework. Our psyche, psychology is such that we can desire sincerely, genuinely, fully, entirely contradictory things. Our psychology doesn't care about logic in its desire structure. So how do we organize that? I submit to you that the maximal possibilities for human freedom, once our legal freedom has been reasonably secured, come from the optimal organization, from the more or less successful integration of our inner lives. When Douglas, listening to his enslaver, recognizes that learning would forever unfit him to be a slave, he is hearing a recognition that education catalyzes inner developments that transform your life from the inside out in a way that liberates and that is irreversible. Liberal education is not a theoretical abstraction removed from how we live our lives. Liberal knowledge is earthly and rooted in the contingencies and dilemmas of life. It involves foresight as well as intuition, calculation as well as value judgment, clarity as well as ambiguity, explicitness as well as elusiveness. Scientific knowledge, on the other hand, tends to progress cumulatively. It builds on the discovery of the past and adds new ones on top of those. We understand infectious disease, electromagnetic radiation, climate change, etc., much better today than we did 50 years ago. We call this progress. But liberal education doesn't quite progress in that way. We don't understand the experience of grief or how to live with the consciousness of death or the meaning of love and nobility any better today than we did 100 years ago. The latest war novel is not an improvement on the Iliad. The same goes for art. Warhol and Rothko are not superior to Michelangelo and Renoir. Art doesn't, doesn't get better as time goes on. Liberal education is not about the production of knowledge, but about the formation and cultivation of human beings. Knowledge, information, facts, cognitive skill, critical thinking are all involved, but they come not as aims in themselves, but as tools and instruments for an aim that is of an altogether different sort. An aim that has to do with the subjective quality of whole lives. An aim which cannot be boiled down to determinate formulations and which therefore is rather hard to measure. It's worth remembering that universities were established in an environment of information scarcity. Some of us remember when it was a thing to have access to a university library. You know, people would choose their jobs, the, the, the place where they lived in, um, who they would marry uh, based on access to a good university library. But we're in a different world now. The least thing that our students need is to be given more information. The biggest thing that they need is some way of judging what information matters and what doesn't what information is worth giving attention to. Attention, not information, is now the scarce resource. Students need to educate their attention. Liberal education works by reorienting attention. It uses information, but what matters is the direction towards which, towards which the student's attention is turned. That is, liberal education works on the affective disposition of the student. You might remember this quote from Plato's Republic. 
Education isn't what some people declare it to be, namely putting knowledge into the souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. But our present discussion, on the other hand, shows that the power to learn is present in everyone's soul and that the instrument with which each learns is like an eye that cannot be turned from darkness to light without turning the whole body. Then education is the craft concerned with doing this very thing, this turning around, and with how the soul can most easily and effectively be made to do it. It isn't the craft of putting sight into the soul. Education takes for granted that sight is there, but that it isn't turned the right way or looking where it ought to look and tries to redirect it appropriately. Another way of saying this is that liberal education concerns the redirection of the student's affective disposition, that liberal education is about teaching students how to organize their freedom, teaching them to discern what objects are most worth their attention. This necessarily involves questions of value. So liberal education is also an education in values. It is not that liberal education tells students what is right or wrong. That would no longer be liberal education but indoctrination. Liberal education teaches students how to think and investigate in a values conscious way. Liberal education lives in the questions, not in the answers. So back to the story for a minute of rescuing Socrates. By the time I started writing the book, I had spent 10 years as director of the Columbia University Center for the Core Curriculum, and many more than that teaching and advocating for liberal education based on the study of foundational texts. Even though I have always recognized that the value of liberal education is rooted in a subjective and personal experience, throughout my time as director of the core curriculum, I avoided making the case for liberal education with reference to my own life story. My reluctance stemmed from my distaste for the stereotypes associated with the immigrant story. You know, the rise from poverty and marginality through education. It's not that these things aren't true about me, but that I have been averse to turning those aspects of my life into an identity. In the same way, and probably for similar reasons, I have resisted a force I have felt pressing on me from the whole culture to define my identity primarily in terms of my, my ethnicity and the color of my skin. But the decision to write a book making a full case for liberal education caused something to unlatch inside of me. It was suddenly clear that I could only write such a book in the first person and with my whole self in it. My case for liberal education would, ha would have to weave together the arguments and insights I have developed over the course of my academic career with an honest examination of my inner and outer life and how it had been shaped by liberal education. That is what Rescuing Socrates is about. I hope that you permit me tonight to speak a little bit as I do in my book um, in a more personal register um, than, than merely academic. To get to some of the bio, biographical details and get them out of the way, I grew up in, the, in a small town, a small rural town in the foothills of big mountains in the Dominican Republic. I came to the United States at the age of 12, two days before my 12th birthday, not speaking English, the town I grew up in, I grew up in in the Dominican Republic is in, in the interior, as they say. It was a town still immersed in the agrarian and pre-industrial rhythms of the 19th century. It extended six streets in one direction and four streets in the other. My childhood, ad, my childhood address was Calle 6, Casa 7, the seventh house on the sixth street. I remember when our roads were paved and when we got running water, at home, we had no television, no stove, no refrigerator, no phone. Sometimes as a shorthand, I say that I grew up in the 19th century among people who had grown up in the 18th century. So there is a considerable distance, not measurable in miles, between there and this podium. The role that a liberal education played in that trajectory is the motive force, the little engine that drives my advocacy of liberal education and which gives it its particular contours. 
I landed in New York City in 1985 with my older brother to join my mother who had immigrated two years earlier. In many ways, we were a typical Dominican immigrant family, poor, not speaking English, and with little knowledge of what life in the United States would entail. But having seen enough to be convinced that whatever it was, it would have better opportunities for us than life in the Dominican Republic. My mother got and then lost a minimum wage job in a garment factory. My brother and I moved to the basement room in a household of a distant relative for a few years while mom fared on her own. We went to the local public school. We didn't live paycheck to paycheck since we didn't have jobs. We lived hand to mouth. It was, it was rough going and I talk about it someone in, the, in my book. But the point is that when I speak about how a liberal education can illuminate a, lot, a life, give people unique tools to navigate their inner and outer worlds, and empower them to transform their reality, I speak from personal experience. I mentioned earlier how I wanted for the title of my book to contain the words liberal education and how it doesn't. What did make it to the title was the phrase, great books. Out in the broader world of the humanities, there is a lot of hostility to the idea of great books. The most scathing review of my book by an eminent Harvard professor is titled, What's so great about great books courses? The answer the author gives, to put it mildly, is not much. <laughs> so let me say a word about great books, aware that here I'm not even preaching to the converted, but more like preaching to the College of Cardinals. Let me begin with the adjective great. With reference to books, great is of course a contestable term. We may disagree about what constitutes greatness in a book. Not only that, there's a widespread belief among professors of literature that there is no such thing as a great book. That the designation great is only a way of asserting and perpetuating particular power structures and prevailing forms of discursive domination and exclusion. I will not engage with this widespread belief among the literary intelligentsia, except to say that while the view is based on an important insight, it takes that insight and turns it into an absurd dogma. We can take the insight without adopting the dogma. We can think of a great book as one that contributes in some outstanding way to the kind of liberal education I have been describing. A great book speaks to our shared human condition. That is, it speaks beyond its immediate historical and cultural context. It is not great because it reflects its specific cultural, historical, and economic situatedness. It is great because it speaks beyond that, to something that transcends its historical particularity and illuminates our shared humanity. Moby Dick is not great because of its detailed portrayal of the New England whaling industry. It is great for some other reason. The Divine Comedy is not great because of Dante's immersion in the theology of the medieval church or in the factional intrigues of Central Italy's politics. The Divine Comedy is great because in the midst of those trappings, it can reveal something that is vitally meaningful to, say, a 21st century unbelieving Dominican immigrant to the United States. By the same token, it is not Toni Morrison's immersion in the legacy of African-American slavery that makes her novels great, but her ability to make that human experience alive and accessible to someone who has no historical connection to it. Great works are great because of an evident yet elusive capacity to illuminate our shared humanity. Another characteristic of great books is that they tend to be complex resisting ideological reduction or use as a source for indoctrination. In the case of great literature, great books are not summarizable. You can only get what great literature has to give by experiencing it as it is. You have to go through it. It's the experience of it, not the knowledge of what it says that does the work of literature. The Wikipedia entry on it will not do. The summary, the spark notes will not do. The plot will not do. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said of Revelation, it cannot be had secondhand. One more word about great literature, and with this, I will begin to wrap up my formal remarks so that we can 
have the kind of robust Q&A that I've now gotten used to here at St. John's. <laughs> Great literature is the absolute best way we have for approaching the experience of what it's like to be someone else. In the form of the novel, I believe it is the most successful technology ever devised to understand the world from someone else's point of view. You cannot get inside somebody's head. The closest thing you can do is read great literature. Through great literature, you can spend hour after hour seeing the world and reasoning through complex situations with someone of a different gender, class, culture, and time. You know, part of the problem with our technological revolution, or revolutions, is that they have been driven by engineering breakthroughs and shaped by people with computational genius who can be quite naive about history, philosophy, art, and literature. This is actually one of the reasons why liberal education while being progressively weakened in the contemporary university is in fact more important today than it has ever been. For the psychological complexities of human behavior have preoccupied great writers since forever. And there is something profound for us to learn about human behavior by studying great writers. In fact, there is something profound to be learned by reading great literature that cannot be learned in any other way. Great books give us access to truths about the human condition that are not available in any other form. Not in the hard sciences, not in the social sciences, and not in the course of our ordinary human experience in the world. To understand what is ethical, to understand what policies will work, to evaluate the consequences of a given technology, to anticipate how society will assimilate an invention, you need to understand something broadly called culture. You can think of culture as a grid of interconnected practices, traditions, and values, and implicit understandings in which every individual is embedded. We live radically embedded in these webs and have no existence outside of them. To understand an individual, you have to understand culture. And there is no better way to understand a culture than through the enduring stories it tells about itself and the arguments that have shaped its understanding of itself. Writing in 1940, the intellectual Louis Munford, observing the rise of fascism in Europe, criticized Western liberalism for its tepid response and wrote an essay in the New Republic called The Corruption of Liberalism that states, among other things, it is not in Ricardo or Marx or Lenin but in Dante and Shakespeare and Dostoevsky that an understanding of the true sources of fascism are to be found. We are we're in a moment today of a pivotal moment in global politics. Uh, the war in Ukraine, I think it's understood by everyone to mark some kind of transition um, into, into a new era of, of great power conflicts um, that it's quite unpredictable. You know, there, there, there's been, just to take an example, there's been increasing calls for NATO to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine, for example. And you know, NATO has said, no, we, we're not going to do that. That's too provocative. Um, because of course, that means shooting down Russian airplanes flying over Ukrainian airspace. Um, one can imagine, and imagine for a moment, the, word, the war taking a turn, perhaps because of the atrocities being committed or perhaps because of the introduction of chemical weapons or nuclear, tactical nuclear. Imagine that the situation turns such that the public begun, begins to call, say the American public and the public in NATO countries begin to call for this, for this step. How do, does Joe Biden and other NATO leaders go about calculating calculating the risks involved in that escalation. There's no amount of data that is going to give the answer. You need all the data you want to make an informed decision, to make it, but ultimately, it comes from a kind of intuition, a kind of judgment that can only be honed and trained through the kind of education I am talking about, and especially through encounters with great literature. 
Let me end with this. Sometimes people say that the point of liberal education is exactly its uselessness, that it is not pursued as a means to obtain anything else, but that it is simply sought for its own sake. I see the point, but I disagree with that way of putting it. A liberal education is extremely useful, and we pursue it for the highest of human ends. To put it simply, a liberal education is there to help you find your way. And this is your basic task in life, to find your way. There is, in the final analysis, nothing else to do in your life but to find your way. Not someone else's way, not the way of your role models or of your, el or of your elders, not the way of success, but your way. A liberal education does not tell you what your way is, but it equips you for a kind of self-exploration and investigation of the world around you that can lead to genuine living, to a life of honesty and clarity. That life might include making a lot of money, but it might not. The point of liberal education is not to make you rich. That life might include having an impact on many lives around you, but it might not. The point of liberal education is not to make you a benefactor of humanity. That life might include many friends, or it might not. The point isn't to make you popular or affable. But a liberally educated life will be richer than otherwise. It will be more true. It will be more awake. It will be more alive and creative. And it will be more free. To modify a quote from Henry David Thoreau, if a liberal education does one thing, it is to ensure that when you come to die, you don't then discover that you have not lived. Thank you.